Suna Baba. Protectors of the Suna. Suna Baba. Protectors of the Suna. In Alhamdulillah, wa salat, wa salam Allah, wa rasul Allah. We're continuing with our topic of belief in Allah. This is the basic of Islam, the essence of Islam. And again, we do many topics here, but we always come back to Tawheed, because Tawheed is the essence of Islam. Yesterday, we spoke about how Allah tells us in the Quran that we have role models to reflect upon who were unswerving in their faith. And one such great role model for us was Prophet Abraham. How Prophet Abraham, he faced all kind of obstacles in life. He went through bad times with his, his family, with his country, to the point where he was exiled. He was forced to leave his country and, and go to another part of the world to live his way of life, and he did so. But his test did not end there. Allah kept trying him and trying him over and over and over again, and we talked about how for a believer, when bad things happen to the true believer in life, those bad things are not punishments. Instead, they are uh, Allah's way of causing you to be, again, forgiven for your sins. They're only punishments. Bad things that happen, be it sickness, drought, famine, divorce, whatever, bad things are only punishments to those of us who are not practicing our religion as we should be, those of us who are swerving in our faith. And so today what we're going to do is speak about what should we emphasize? What, is the, what should be emphasized when it comes to Islam? When learning about your religion, what is it that should be taught to you first? When you are a person of the Dawah speaking about Islam or calling people to Islam, what should you emphasize the most? This is what we're going to talk about today because we're living in the days where everybody wants to be a scholar, everybody wants to be a caller to Islam. You got all social media, Facebook, Twitter, and all these things with Muslims calling themselves, speaking about our way of life, but they're speaking about the wrong things. What should be emphasized first? And how should the Dawah be done? That's what we're going to speak about today. And again, first of all, Allah tells us in the Quran, in the interpretation, the meaning, say to them, he was talking to our prophet Muhammad. He said, say to them, Muhammad, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, that this is my way, and I invite to Allah with sure knowledge. I and whoever follows me also must invite to Allah with sure knowledge. Glorified and exalted is Allah, and I am not one of those who associate partners. This is a powerful verse of the Quran that the Muslims today need to ponder the meaning of. I want you guys to understand, here Allah is letting us know that calling to him is not only an obligation, but in order to fulfill that obligation, there is a condition. What is the condition? You have to have knowledge. That is the condition. The condition is you must have knowledge of Islam. You must have knowledge of what you're calling to, subhanAllah. And this is the problem today. We have so many Muslims out there call themselves people of the Dawah. You call yourselves calling others to Islam, speaking about our religion, answering questions, but you have no knowledge. You can't explain things. You have no knowledge of what you're talking about. So instead of you calling people to Islam, you're calling them to something else. You're calling them to something else. And that's why our way of life is so distorted. Our way of life as Muslims today has been distorted so terribly. And not from the Kafir. Our way of life is distorted because of the way we project it, the way we as Muslims have projected it to others, because we lack the true knowledge. 
the true understanding. And let me give you an example. Our Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam told us what should be emphasized. Today you find Muslims on Facebook talking about polygamy. Oh, this is so ridiculous. Why would you speak about polygamy to non-Muslims? Why would you talk about polygamy to people who don't even believe in the concept of God? Why would you talk about hijab to a woman who doesn't even believe in God? She's going to look at you as being oppressive to her. So you're not, you're, you don't give dawah by telling people about polygamy, by explaining the hijab to people. You don't give dawah by telling people they have to fast every for a whole month. They're going to look at you like you're crazy. I can't do that. That's ridiculous. That's too hard. You don't begin with that. Instead, our Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam told us what to do when speaking about Islam, when inviting to Islam, when teaching Islam. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam sent Mu'ad to Yemen. Who was Mu'ad? He was one of the eminent companions. He was one of the first ambassadors of Islam. When the people of Yemen converted to Islam or wanted to learn about Islam, the Prophet sent Mu'ad to teach them. And he told them, I am sending you to Yemen, and you will come upon the people of the book, meaning Jews and Christians. They are not of our faith. They are not of our belief. But when you come upon them, first call them or teach them to believe that there is none worthy of worship but Allah. That's the first thing. You don't jump up telling people about hijab, about polygamy, about zakat, about fasting Ramadan. No, if you're going to non-Muslims and you want to invite them to our way or educate them of our way of life, if a non-Muslim were to invite me to a seminar to give a lecture to them about Islam, I am not going to talk about polygamy. I am not going to talk about hijab. I'm going to talk about La ilaha illallah, what it means to believe in Allah. I would do a lecture like this. I would do a lecture like what I'm teaching you guys in this series, what it means to believe in Allah, the things that invalidate that belief. Because, again, unless a person believes in Allah, unless a person accepts him as being a supreme, unless a person accepts his laws, accepts his, 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 uh, his commands, then do you think they want to hear about a hijab? You think they want to hear that they have to get rid of their boyfriend? You think they want to hear about how a man can have four wives? Oh, oh, come on. Also in another version of this hadith, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam told Mu'ad, he said, when you go to Yemen, teach the people first to single out Allah alone in worship. And once they learn that, then move to the next step and teach them that Allah has enjoined upon them to pray five times a day. And once they learn that, then move to the next step and teach them that Allah has imposed upon them to give in charity. And once they learn that and do that, then be careful not to take the best of their property from them in charity. And also, Mu'ad, protect yourself against the supplication of those who have suffered injustice because there is no screen between a person who has been treated wrongly and their supplication to Allah. SubhanAllah. This is a powerful, powerful hadith that the Muslims on Facebook, the Muslims on social media, those of you in these Islamic Muslim students associations, you call yourselves people of Dawah, you all need to ponder this hadith. Here the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is laying out the steps as to what we should emphasize 
when speaking and teaching about our way of life. Again, it all begins and ends with tall heat. It all begins and ends with accepting and understanding that there is no God except the law and he has no partner. That's the first thing. And then once the people understand that, once they accept that, that's what brings them into Islam. That's what makes them Muslim. And then you can move to the next thing. The next thing that should be taught, what do we teach the new convert? I get that question all the time. The new convert should then be taught how to perform their prayers because they are obligated. You are obligated to perform your prayers as soon as you take Shahada. Whatever prayer is in after you take Shahada, that's the first prayer you will make and you will continue on until you die. So you have to teach them how to pray properly. Teach them the Fatiha. Teach them how to make wudu. Teach them the steps and all of that. Okay? And once they learn how to pray correctly, then we move on to the next step, which is letting them know that they have to pay zakat from any property that they have left over at the end of the year. And our zakat is not much. It's only $25 for every thousand. If you got $2,000 saved up after all your living expenses at the end of the year, then you just pay $50 in charity to the mosque. That's it. And then once they understand that, then you can tell them, and also, by the way, we fast during the month of Ramadan. Ramadan comes around once a year, and we fast from dawn till sunset. That's when you explain that. But again, we don't move until they understand each pillar step by step. That's why when people, new shahadas come to my website and they ask me about polygamy and things like that, I don't answer. I tell them we're going to talk about that some other time. Right now I want you to focus in on joining my classes, my Tawhi class every day. Let's start with the basics, and then by the time you understand the basics, we'll, you will then understand polygamy and that other stuff. Baby steps, guys. Baby steps. Also, we have another hadith, whereas one of the companions tells us that the Prophet ﷺ called them all together during the battle, right before the Battle of Khyber. And he said, tomorrow I will give the flag that we bear to a person who loves Allah and who I love too and who Allah loves as well. And in return, Allah will give victory to us under his leadership because of the love this person has for me and Allah. So the people went to bed that night wondering who is it that will receive such a great honor. And the next morning, the prophet gave the flag to Ali. Okay? At that time, Ali wasn't present because he was suffering from an infection in his eye. He had the pink eye or something. So the prophet went and uh, uh, cured him of his help through the mercy of Allah, cured him of his pink eye. And then the prophet gave him the flag and said, go forward with ease and gentleness on the battlefield. And before you fight against them, speak to them about Islam. Call them to our way of life. Tell them about our religion. Tell them what their duties to Allah would be if they converted to Islam. Because perhaps Allah may guide even one of them to Islam through your speech. And that would be better for you, more rewarding for you than to have a bunch of red camels. Red camels are of great wealth in the desert. They're very expensive, worth a lot of money. It's like a Cadillac or a Lexus. Okay? So what do you learn from this? Again, here you can see this is a battle. This is war. This is when the Muslims were fighting against the Jews. 
And you can see before the prophet sent Ali on that battlefield, he said, meet with them. Try to establish a rapport with them first. See if you can get them to submit to some type of peace treatment, peace treaty, some type of agreement before we actually go to battle. And then when you're speaking to them about peace, also tell them about our way of life. Tell them what we believe in as Muslims, that we're not bad people. Get them to help them to try to understand that we're not bad people. We're good people who just want to live our lives believing in and worshiping Allah. Tell them what our duties are, how we pray five times a day, how we give in charity to help one another, and perhaps they will be so impressed by you that not only will they go into a peace agreement with us, but also they may even convert to our way of life. You see that, guys? That's how we should be as Daya. Not jumping all over the place, giving people information about our religion that's hard for them to accept. We have to learn to begin with the baby steps first. So what are some of the lessons we learn from these hadiths? What are some of the lessons we learn from these verses of the Quran? Well, again, first of all, yes, inviting to Islam or speaking about Islam is the way of all Muslims. I want you guys to know, too, that dawah is not just through the tongue, but through your actions. In fact, that's the greatest dawah. You don't have to speak about it. Because, again, in order to speak about our religion, you have to have knowledge of it. You have to have knowledge of what you're talking about. So if you don't have the knowledge, then don't speak about it. Instead, be an example through your behavior, through your attitude, your actions. And also, before you open your mouth to even discuss our religion, check your intentions. Because again, so many of us, we're doing deeds that seem pleasing to Allah, but we're doing it for the wrong reasons. You want to be a rock star. You want to be a Dawa star. You want to be the next top Dai. Make sure that that's not your intention. And also, not only must you have clear intentions, not only must you have knowledge of what you're about to speak about, but you have to be free of blasphemy. You can't lie about our religion. You can't say things about Islam that's not true. And also, check yourself. You cannot be a person of shirk, a person who associates partners with a law. And also, in order to call to this beautiful way of life, you're calling the unbelievers. You have to make sure that you are not one of them. In other words, you're not imitating them. And this is a big problem today. So many Muslims are looking for acceptance, acceptance from the Kafir. You want the Kafir to accept you. You want the Kafir to approve of you. So you're doing things to earn and win their acceptance, their approval. This is wrong. The only acceptance you should be seeking is from a law. You don't blend in to be like them. Remember, as a Muslim, there are certain characteristics you have to have. And one of those characteristics is you must be distinct. You must stand out over them, not blend in and be like them. And again, whenever we speak about this way of life, it all begins with Tawheed. You should not be conversing with non-Muslims about polygamy, about hijab, or any of that stuff. What you should be conversing to them about is what it means to believe in Allah. Because they all say they believe in Allah. But no, what does it truly mean to believe in Allah? It means to believe in his books, to believe in his angels, all of them, his prophets, all of them, to believe in the hereafter, to believe in his decree, not to believe in love. That's the type of stuff you should be talking about. To believe in a law means that you believe in and accept his laws. You wouldn't fornicate. You wouldn't adulterate. You wouldn't do drugs because you know this is against the religion. It's against Christianity to drink. It's against Christianity to fornicate, to adulterate. But they do it. That means they don't believe. So these are the things you should be emphasizing. 
to the non-Muslim what it means to believe in Allah. And even with the Muslims too, like I do with you guys here. All of you are Muslims. But I have to reemphasize what our purpose is, why you were created, and why you were born. I have to emphasize it every day to you. Also, again, you learn from these hadiths. You learn from these verses of the Quran that you have to follow the steps. Do not move forward until each step is understood. I am not going to speak about uh, Salat until you understand Tawheed, that la ilaha illallah, Muhammad Rasulullah. I am not going to talk about fasting during Ramadan until you understand the importance of prayer. I am not going to move on to, uh, 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 to, to, to hijab and polygamy and, and all of that until you understand all those pillars. And again, it's up to you, the daya. It's up to you, the scholar. It's up to you, the caller, the teacher, to stay away and clear away any misunderstandings from the listener. You have to be able to answer the questions, guys. If you cannot give detailed answers, then you got no business speaking about this religion to anyone. You have to be able to clear up any misunderstandings that that person may have. And also we learn that, again, you have to be careful, too, to not violate the rights of others to not transgress the rights of others when calling them to Islam, when speaking about Islam. Because even though they are non-Muslims, Allah hates injustice. And Allah hears the prayer of anyone who is oppressed, be it a Muslim or a non-Muslim. That's why the non-Muslims can call upon God when they're going through problems in life, and God will, will listen and answer them. This is their paradise. Remember, the life of this world is the paradise for the Kafir. Allah doesn't answer their supplications in the hereafter, but he answers their supplications in this world. This is their paradise. So be careful how you treat them. Be careful not to transgress them, because if they make do against you and you're being unjust to them, Allah will listen, Allah will hear, and Allah will deal with you, which is why we Muslims are being dealt with the way we are today because so many are transgressing the rights of others. And also we learn that even in wartime, when fighting against non-Muslims, we do not declare war before sitting down with them, trying to go into a peace agreement with them. And when we go into those agreements, try to explain your way of life. Try to get them to understand that I'm not a bad person. I'm just a person who believes in Allah. I'm just a person who wants to live my life doing deeds that are pleasing to him, helping the poor, helping the needy, helping those who are in need of help. And finally, we learn from these hadiths, we learn from these verses of the Quran that if you are a person who follows that methodology as given to us by our Prophet, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, and Allah, and because of that, you become a tool that Allah uses to guide others to Islam, then you will receive the greatest reward for that. That's ongoing charity. Every time that person prays, you will get credited with that reward. Every time that person wears hijab, every time that person says, La ilaha illallah, Allah will give you credit for that, even after your death. Because you were the tool, you were, were the instrument that Allah used to guide that person. So thus, guys, that's how we call to Islam. That's how we teach Islam. That's how we speak about Islam. We'll stop right here for today. Tomorrow we'll continue by speaking more about this beautiful way of life. If Sunnah protectors of the Sunnah. Sunnah Babas.